Good evening everyone and welcome to the Sunday evening update or should I say good afternoon and welcome to this Tuesday special edition of the update program. Yes, today we'll be talking with Mr. Gary Taubes. Many of you are familiar with him as a prolific author on many science issues, is particularly uh, getting into the diet and nutrition debates. And uh, of course, of those of you that tune in, a uh, typical uh, episode are used to a lot of news and updates. However, we'll be saving that for the Sunday program coming up this October 12th. Today, mainly just the interview and I want to encourage everyone who might have some questions for Mr. Taubes as we go along through the interview uh, please use the chat the text chat box uh, to ask any questions that you have of him and without further ado I'd like to introduce to the program tonight Mr. Gary Taubes. How are you doing this oh, evening? Thank I'm doing well thank you. Good to be here. Yes great to have you as well and I just want to uh, get started with uh, a question as to how you got involved in the great diet debate. What was the, say, precipitating moment? We might as well jump right in uh, to the uh, uh, main theme of uh, your, uh, let's say, uh, uh, how you became uh, rather well known in the debate as far as low carb versus uh, uh, the high fat or low fat diet. Uh, what was the, back uh, a few years back, uh, what was the thing that got you uh, interested in this uh, area of nutrition? Well, you know, I kind of slid into it slowly. First, I, uh, you know, my interest was always controversial science okay. back in uh, the 80s, writing about physics and cold fusion, if you remember that. And yes. Some of the guys, some of the physicists I knew in cold fusion suggested that I start writing about, uh, I do a story about the idea that electromagnetic fields cause cancer, and uh, that was based on uh, observational epidemiology, so I got into observational epidemiology, and then I got into uh, writing about the controversy over salt and blood pressure, and while I was doing that, one of the worst scientists I ever met ever interviewed, and I'd interviewed some terrible scientists in my life, um, took credit for getting Americans not only to eat less salt in their diets, but getting them to eat less fat and less eggs as well. And I literally got off the phone with this guy and called my editor at the journal Science, where I was doing the salt and blood pressure story, and I said, you know, one of the worst scientists I've ever interviewed just took credit for getting Americans to eat less fat and less eggs. And so when I'm done with this salt and blood pressure story, I'm going to do a story on dietary fat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know what the story is, but I know if this guy was involved, there's a story there. Sure. And that was basically it. I did this piece for Science Magazine, the soft science of dietary fat, and then I did this somewhat infamous story for the New York Times Magazine on, uh, you know, what if it's all been a big fat lie. Sure. And that kind of uh, made you a lightning rod then back in the uh, 1980s, I take it. Well, that was uh, 2002. Oh, oh that was 2002. Came out. Yeah, uh, oh, sorry. That, yeah, a lightning rod's a good way to put it. <laughs> um, I was kind of, even though I'd written about, like I said, controversial science my whole life, I was still kind of stunned by the response of people when you suggested that, you know, obesity might be caused by carbohydrates and which is uh, heart disease might be a, a carbohydrate related problem not a fat related problem sure yeah you know um i was mistaken that uh, you had uh, written that new york times piece a while back because as i grew up in the uh late 1970s and into the 1980s it, 80s it, that seemed to be the time where the uh extremely low fat diet became in vogue uh and i remember well, i remember in particular that eggs were vilified. I mean, they were basically considered poison uh, for well, anyone. I, remember I, was, I was actually working at Discover Magazine in the 1980s, which was owned by what was then Time Incorporated. And I remember when Time did this famous cover with, uh, and now the bad news, you know, cholesterol and now the bad news, and it was a, a plate with a Two, scram two fried eggs for the eyes and a piece of bacon for the mouth. And, yeah, I, we all, through the 1980s, like, we stopped eating eggs. We stopped eating. I mean, I was living on skinless chicken breasts and 
Sure. You know, pasta with uh, fresh salsa. You don't want to use butter or oil because they both <laughs> had fat in it. Um, oh yeah. I mean, it was an interesting era. This is what people. Yeah, I get. I get. Um, People accuse me of being an Atkins devotee because I was foolish enough to actually try the Atkins diet as an experiment when mm -hmm. I was writing this story for science on dietary fat. And the fact that I lived for 10 years on a low-fat diet just like everyone else did, and it was worse than that. I lived in Los Angeles to the 1990s. So this was, you know, hardcore, low-fat, health food, sure. um, tofu burgers, and, you know, you just keep getting heavier and heavier. I worked out every Sure. I mean, from what I've uh, seen, it seems the uh, extremely low-fat diet uh, w has been probably, it could be possibly the worst diet advice that has ever been, uh, that has ever been you know, promulgated by any, uh, you know, uh, state, government, you know, uh, any type of uh, nutrition organization, but everyone was on that bandwagon for a long time. Yeah, it's, it's a little crazy. I mean, again, I don't... Um I suspect it's done an extraordinary amount of damage, but it's hard, again, since the studies don't actually exist to demonstrate, you can say that the diet doesn't do any good. Okay. You know, going on a low-fat diet, you can definitely say that it's, it's at best, um, at best it's harmless, <laughs> but that's the best possible scenario, and it certainly doesn't help anyone. Well, it seems... And yet... Yeah, okay. Go ahead. Well, it's also one of the things that shocked me doing the research for good calories, bad calories, was, you know, the reason we were doing this was for heart disease, in theory. And there's actually only been two studies that were ever done that looked at low-fat diets, at least two studies ever done up until this huge women's health initiative of about five years ago. But until the 21st century, only two studies had ever been done looking at the efficacy of a low-fat diet against heart disease. And one was a British study that found no effect, and the other was a Hungarian study in the early 1960s that was published in a Hungarian journal in Hungarian. Wow. And um, that was it. That was it. That was it. That was the total amount of clinical trials looking at a low-fat diet. And how... And all the other how did it become so ingrained in the public consciousness? I know you mentioned, I was doing a little bit of reading beforehand, uh, you mentioned some of it might have been political uh, or, um, or pseudo-religious kind of objections to eating meat, but also some uh, a bad science perhaps. Uh, was it a combination of a bunch of things? I mean, obviously there was something in the United States anyway, in my experience, that solidified the low-fat diet as... Some, being the best possible possible diet ever, you know, it doesn't matter well, how. Well, you know, the American Heart Association got behind it very early in the nineteen early nineteen sixties. Oh. And they got behind it pushed basically by the uh, efforts of two. I call them scientists is probably uh, too good a word for it, but two researchers, Ansel Keys and Jeremy. Uh, Stamler, and uh, so the American Heart Association got behind it. The press saw the American Heart Association as a source of unbiased wisdom on heart disease. So the press got behind it, and then Congress got behind it because the, you know, the staffers working in congressional offices, all they knew was basically what they read in the newspapers. And um, then you had these drug studies that finally by the mid-1980s, 1984, were able to show that if you lower cholesterol with a drug, uh, you can have a very, very, very tiny beneficial effect on longevity. And so there was this notion that, you know, if a drug lowers cholesterol and improves and lengthens your life or reduces your heart disease risk, then a diet that lowers cholesterol will do the same thing. And, you know, mm. public health authorities were just dead set on... on convincing us all that this was the thing to do, and the press bought it hook, line, and 